Hello. Welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. My name is Matt. Thank you for listening. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution of the United States grants Congress the powers to declare war and to issue letters of mark and reprisal. Earlier in the Constitution, it pretty explicitly bars any other governmental entity in the country from doing so, including state governments. Back in the 1700s, this was a pretty major development in terms of international maritime relations, which tends to be the case with a lot of what was found in the U.S. Constitution. Nobody else in the Atlantic world had a constitution yet. Most of them lived under some form of monarchy, which was naturally the highest power in government policy. What was so literally revolutionary about the constitution was that it codified a lot of rules that had formerly been merely the prerogative of a king who could retract or change them at his will. A document like the Constitution gave liberal reformers and Age of Enlightenment philosophers and revolutionary Republicans all over the world a, an example they could point to and say that. We want something like that. When it comes to letters of mark and privateers, Article 1, Section 8 gave the U.S. a lot of moral high ground to wag their finger at all the powers of Europe for their reckless use of privateers, and they did a bunch. Privateering was not in any way, shape, or form regulated internationally. Anybody could and did use them. Now, shortly after the American Revolution, during the French Revolution, Benjamin Franklin put a lot of pressure on France to end the practice of letters of mark and privateering. And the National Convention in France actually did put a stop to it. But as with so much of the other progress made during the French Revolution, Napoleon decided it was a bad idea and walked it back. The last privateers commissioned by the United States were actually in response to the global conflict in the Napoleonic Wars, more specifically because of the Haitian Revolution here, but it's all part of the same thing here in the early 1800s. It was at the end of the Crimean War, in the Paris Declaration of 1856, that most of Europe signed an agreement to stop using privateers. It had gotten pretty out of hand by that point. Russia, as usual, decided to ignore that, though, and continued doing so, even up until the 1905 Russo-Japanese War. It was only at the end of that, at the Hague Convention in 1907, that privateering was finally, more or less permanently, put to bed. Now, as an aside here, there's actually a lot of international pressure to revive the practice of privateering, of arming private merchant vessels. You know, all around the world... People are dealing with stateless terrorism and especially problems like Somali piracy. And because of all these international regulations, ship owners are virtually powerless to defend themselves. But the reason I'm bringing all of this up today is because I want to illustrate just how much had to happen to finally put an end to unfettered privateering. It was a powerful tool, but it was also a real problem for several centuries. That's part of the reason why William III chose not to utilize privateering, at least not very much. You know, English policy was already moving in that direction, but the Dutch had already done away with privateering more or less. Take the three most famous Dutch privateers of the era, Mikhail Andrézun, La Rode de Graaf, Nicholas von Horn, they're all Dutchmen, but they sailed under French colors. The French were happy to utilize privateering at this point and for some decades following, but securing a privateering commission from King William III was a very, very long shot in 1695, and the four Whig lords behind Captain William Kidd knew it. Nonetheless, that's exactly what they were going to do. This is episode 227. Pirates, Freebooters, and Sea Rovers. 
We've been spending a lot of time setting up all of the men behind the contracts and negotiations surrounding Captain William Kidd's pirate hunting. All of that is going to matter quite a bit in the future. There are a lot of questions surrounding the days leading up to Captain Kidd's departure. Questions on which a bunch of reputations hung and on which life and death was hanging. A lot of accusations got thrown around after the fact. For example, no one even really knows who brought up the idea of a pirate hunting expedition. William Kidd said it was the Earl of Bellamont's idea. Bellamont said it was Richard Livingston that came up with the plot, and Livingston said it was William Kidd. For my money, and this is all part of the theory that Livingston was conspiring to bring down Governor Benjamin Fletcher, but I think it was Livingston. We know and have some pretty good evidence that Captain Kidd was after a job with the Royal Navy, not just a privateering commission. And Livingston was perfectly positioned here. He knew on the one hand about all of the illegal operations between Fletcher and the pirates, and on the other, about Bellamont's potential interest in New York. Even if the idea wasn't originally Livingston's, he was key to the entire operation. It never would have gotten off the ground without him. And the linchpin here to the whole theory comes down to the actual text of the two documents that governed William Kidd's expedition. The first of these was a contract between Livingston, Bellamont, and William Kidd, their Articles of Agreement. The original text of that article was lost, but it was recreated after the fact, and I'm going to read it here in full. Articles of Agreement Made the tenth day of October in the year of our Lord 1695, between the Right Honorable Richard, Earl of Bellamont of the one part, and Robert Livingston Esquire, and Captain William Kidd of the other part. Whereas the said Captain William Kidd is desirous of obtaining a commission as captain of a private man of war in order to take prizes from the king's enemies and other ways to annoy them, and whereas certain persons did some time since depart from New England, Rhode Island, New York, and other parts in America, and elsewhere, with an intention to become pirates, and to commit spoils and depredations against the laws of nations, in the Red Sea, or elsewhere, and to return with such goods and riches as they should get to certain places by them agreed upon of which said persons and places the said Captain Kidd hath notice, and is desirous to fight with and subdue the said pirates, as also other pirates with whom Captain Kidd shall meet at sea, in case he is empowered to do so. And whereas it is agreed between the same parties that for the purpose aforesaid a good and sufficient ship to the liking of the said Captain Kidd shall be forthwith bought, whereof the said Captain Kidd is to have command. And I'd like to interject here, this is the first period in that very long run-on sentence. It continues, Now those present do witness, and it is agreed between the said parties. 1. The Earl of Bellamont doth covenant and agree at his proper charge to procure from the King's Majesty, or from the Lord's Commissioners of the Admiralty, as the case shall require, one or more commissions, empowering him, the said Captain Kidd, to act against the king's enemies, and to take prizes from them, as a private man of war in the usual manner, and also to fight with, conquer, and subdue pirates, and to take them and their goods, and clauses in such commissions as may be more proper and effectual in such cases. 2. The said Earl of Bellamont doth covenant and agree that within three months after the said Captain Kidd's departure from England, 
for the purposes in these presents mentioned, he will procure, at his proper charge, a grant from the king to be made to some indifferent and trusty person of all such merchandises, goods, treasure, and other things as shall be taken from the said pirates, or any other pirate whatsoever, by the said Captain Kidd, or by the said ship, or any other ship or ships under his command. 3. The said earl doth agree to pay four-fifths parts, the whole in five parts to be divided, of all monies which shall be laid out for the buying such good and sufficient ship for the purposes aforesaid, together with rigging and other apparel, and furniture thereof, and providing the same with competent victualling the said ship to be approved of by the said parties, and the said other one-fifth part of the said charges of the said ship to be paid by the said Robert Livingston and William Kidd. 4. The Earl doth agree that, in order to the speedy buying of the said ship, in part of the said four parts of five of the said charges, he will pay down the sum of fifteen hundred pounds, by way of advance, on or before the sixth day of November next ensuing. 5. The said Robert Livingston and William Kidd do jointly covenant and agree that on and before the sixth day of November, when the Earl of Bellamont is to pay the said sum of sixteen hundred pounds as aforesaid, they will advance and pay down four hundred pounds in part of the share, and proportion which, they are to have in the said ship. Now a few things to note here. First of all, most of this document is about buying the ship and how the monies shall be divided and buying the ship either from the king's shipyards or the lords of the admiralty. But they're not going to buy a ship exactly. We'll get to that in a minute. Second, though, this is the first document we have in which it is mentioned that Captain Kidd will be hunting pirates. More specifically, from New England, Rhode Island, New York, and America. They never mention England. It's all about the American pirates, which excludes Henry Every. Now here, that's not suspicious. They knew about Henry Every, but they didn't know what he was up to yet. For Captain Kidd, the rest of October was taken up in a hunt for a ship, something that would do for his needs, and they looked at a lot of potential vessels in and around London, but none seemed to be up to the task which is kind of expected, you know, every decent ship available in England had been requisitioned by the Navy. William Kidd, though, was being a bit difficult about the specifics of his ship. And to their credit, the investors, namely Livingston and Bellamont, they did listen to William Kidd here. Kidd knew better than any of them exactly what kind of vessel he would need to succeed in his pirate-hunting mission. Things like weight, cargo space, crew quarters, the number of guns, and, most importantly, the rigging. Kidd was probably here, in the market for a ship not unlike the Charles II, the pirate ship Fancy. Atop of the line... Actually, hold on. I'm going to stop that right there. That's a bad phrase to use. As an idiom, top of the line is fine, but when you're actually talking about a ship during the era of ships of the line, that might be a little misleading. You know, a top of the line ship was a first rate ship of the line. I'll say instead that Kidd was looking for a state of the art frigate, and he couldn't find one. All of the ships available in London were rickety and leaky and wholly unsuitable for his needs. Any ships that the Navy didn't scoop up were trash. So Bellamont, Livingston, and Kidd began poking around the local shipyards. If they could find a ship that was under construction that fit Kidd's needs, they might be able to purchase her, but that would be more expensive. Sadly, though, every ship they saw was either already spoken for, usually by the Navy, or was way too large for their needs. 
You know, there were plenty of big, fat merchantmen being built all around, but that's not what Kid needed to hunt pirates. They needed a ship that could go anywhere that a pirate ship could go, which means a smallish vessel. But they also needed a ship that could carry enough guns and men to take a pirate ship down, which means a large-ish vessel. And they needed a ship that was fast enough to catch a pirate ship, which means a medium-ish vessel. You can see all the contradictions here, but you can also see why that was what Captain Kidd needed. I mean, does a ship like that even really exist? We discussed last time some of the psychoanalytical history involved in William Kidd, trying to pin down his motivations. And we discussed his reluctance to take this job in the first place. Now, by this point, he really didn't have a choice. He had five pretty important noblemen breathing down his neck, pressuring him to take the job. But maybe here he was trying to make the specifics of the job impossible. If he set parameters that sounded reasonable but were pretty impossible to be met, maybe he could get out of this mission entirely. But if that was his master plan, it didn't work out. His investors eventually decided they'd had enough. If they couldn't find a ship to buy, they would just build one. It would cost more than initially expected. Kid would unfortunately have to sell his ship, the Antigua. But he didn't really have an option here. He had signed a contract, and it was time to get to work. Kid earned 600 pounds for his ship and put it all towards the construction of a new craft one that met all of his specifications, and they were a little bit wild. It was rigged like a frigate, a ship normally built for speed and maneuverability, and this did have that, but there was one very big difference. Instead of a sleek bottom that rode high in the water, William Kidd's ship was going to have a lower, fatter bottom, because it was going to have oars. Instead of a frigate, he was getting a, a galley, kind of a hybrid, really. It looked not unlike the old Mediterranean ships of the Barbary pirates, except it had much better modern square rigging. But it had a whole deck that, in lieu of good wind, could house oarsmen to row the galley around. Now, Oars and all of the space and weight needed to contain them did make the ship slower in general. She wouldn't be able to keep up with a pirate sloop, and certainly not a vessel like the Fancy. But that was only when those pirate ships had the wind, and he could keep up with them long enough to keep them in view for a while. If, really, when the wind did turn against them, the pirates would be stranded, becalmed, and Captain Kidd... He would have all of those oars. He could send his men down to work them, and they could continue gaining on their prey. What's more, he could maneuver his galley into position to fire on his enemy while avoiding their guns. Now, this kind of ship would not normally work that well for a pirate ship, because that's not what's needed when you're hunting bigger game. When you're hunting big, fat merchantmen, you want a sleek, fast little ship. But for Captain Kidd, hunting pirates, hunting those sleek, fast little ships, this might be the perfect ship for the job. For the rest of October and November, William Kidd's days were spent strolling down to Castle Shipyard in Deptford and overseeing the construction of his new ship and then strolling down to the local coffee house to enjoy the... Sights and Sounds of London. And this was a fascinating time to be taking in London society, and especially the news. Now, much of it wouldn't have been too relevant to Captain Kidd at the time, but while he awaited the construction of his ship, a bunch of news began to filter back to England, all of it involving the East India Company. First, there was the insider trading scandal, We've talked about that a bit before, which Captain Kidd probably didn't care about, but I wonder if he tucked it in the back of his mind. 
It upset a lot of people. It made the East India Company look really bad. Then, though, came the pirates. Not Henry Every. Not yet. There was a trio of French pirate ships that captured East Indiamen belonging to the East India Company. Now, some of those French pirates might have been the Frenchmen that Henry Every would later pick up, but we aren't sure. But still, that's three pirate ships, relatively small craft, taking large and rich and fat East India prizes. On top of the insider trading scandal, it made the company look to be in very dire straits. And then... Well, I don't think word broke to the public immediately. It looks like the Crown tried to keep a lid on what had just happened in the Indian Ocean for as long as they could. But you get this sense that one day, when Captain Kidd went down to the shipyard, the crew working on his galley, he was thinking about calling her the Adventure. That's a good name. But the crew that was working on her seemed a lot bigger. A lot more men, and they were moving fast, too. Wait, this looked like a whole different crew. What was going on here? And no one really knew, but the foreman let him know, we can assume, that new orders had come down. From the higher-ups. From the really higher-ups. The adventure galley was now a top priority. Which is weird. Captain Kidd wasn't in the Navy. This isn't a ship of the line... What was going on? When Livingston met with Kidd next, he would have had a little bit of news, but not much. He knew that Kidd's timetable had been moved up, and knew that Lord Russell, the first Lord of the Admiralty, appeared to be behind it all. But still no real reason why. Nonetheless, in a mere five weeks, this 287-ton ship would be seaworthy, mostly, but Kidd realized that his ship was going to be done much sooner than expected. He had to get his supplies ready and a crew ASAP. Not all of the crew that had sailed from America on board the Antigua were still with him in London. In the past few months, some of them had taken jobs on other ships. They needed to earn a wage, after all. But much of the crew was still intact, but they weren't enough for this much larger vessel. So Kidd had to set about recruiting. Now, he was in London, so recruiting wasn't terribly difficult, but all the respectable men had been snatched up by the Navy. Kidd had to settle for the dregs of whopping. Alcoholic, missing teeth, darkened by the sun, eye patches, rough clothes, scars, and calloused hands. Maybe the best of the best, but maybe not trustworthy. The men he recruited might not have been pirates, but they certainly looked the part. For the next couple of weeks, Kid got everything else in order. He found thirty big guns, thirty-six barrels of gunpowder, over 1,000 cannonballs and more than 100 firearms, including both muskets and pistols. Shortly after the turn of the year, in 1696, Richard Livingston arrived with a satchel and some very big news. Lord Bellamont had just arrived with a document that came down from William Blaythwaite, and beyond him from... Well, I'll just go ahead and read it. William the Third, by the grace of God, King of England, Scotland, and Ireland, Defender of the Faith, etc., to our trusty and well-beloved Captain Robert Kidd, Commander of the Adventure Galley, with a crew of eighty men and mounting thirty guns. Greeting. Whereas we are informed that Captain Thomas II, John Ireland, Captain Thomas Wake, and Captain William Mays, or Mace, and other subjects, natives, or inhabitants of New York, and elsewhere, in our plantations in America, have associated themselves with diverse others, wicked and ill-disposed persons, and do, against the law of nations, commit many and great piracies, robberies, and depredations on the seas upon the parts of America, 
and in other parts to the great hindrance and discouragement of trade and navigation, and to the great danger and hurt of our loving subjects, our allies, and all others, navigating the seas upon their lawful occasions. Now know ye that we, being desirous to prevent the aforesaid mischiefs, and as much as in us lies to bring the said pirates, freebooters, and sea rovers to justice, have thought fit and do hereby give and grant to the said Robert Kidd, to whom our commissioners for exercising the office of Lord High Admiral of England have granted a commission as a private man of war, bearing date the eleventh day of December, 1695, and unto the commander of the said ship for the time being, and unto the officers, mariners, and others which shall be under your command, full power and authority to apprehend, seize, and take into your custody, as well the said Captain Thomas II, John Ireland, Captain Thomas Wake, and Captain Mays or Mace, as all such pirates, freebooters, and sea-rovers, being either our subjects or other nations associated with them, which you shall meet with upon the seas or coasts, with all their ships and vessels, and all such merchandises, money, goods, and wares as shall be found on board, or with them, in case they shall willingly yield themselves. But if they will not yield without fighting, then you are by force to compel them to yield. And we also require you to bring, or cause to be brought, such pirates, freebooters, or sea-rovers as you shall seize, to a legal trial, to the end they may be proceeded against according to the law, in such cases. And we do hereby command all our officers, ministers, and other of our loving subjects whatsoever to be aiding and assisting to you in the premises." And we do hereby enjoin you to keep an exact journal of your proceedings in execution of the premises, and set down the names of such pirates, and of their officers and company, and the names of such ships and vessels, as you shall, by virtue of these presents, take and seize, and the quantities of arms, ammunition, provision, and lading of such ships, and the true value of the same, as near as you can judge." In witness whereof, we have caused our great seal of England to be affixed to these presents, given at our court in Kensington, the 26th day of January, 1696, in the seventh year of our reign. Now a lot of that is really unnecessary and esoteric legalese. There's a reason that the king, or rather his agents, wrote repeatedly, pirates, freebooters, and sea rovers to ensure that they covered all their bases. But of course you'll notice all of the names here. Naturally, William the Third, pretty big name, but then we have the names of William Kidd's targets. Thomas II, Thomas Wake, William Mace, names that we know, all of which have been very recently active in the Indian Ocean. But one very notable name was missing. Henry Every. By December, when this letter of Mark was issued, Henry Avery's capture of the Ganji Sawai was beginning to seep out into the public, but he was not named in this letter of Mark. Now they covered all their bases. They might say to capture pirates out of New York, <clears throat> Benjamin Fletcher, but they do say and elsewhere in our plantations in America. And then they even go so far as to say, who have associated themselves with diverse others, wicked and ill-disposed persons. They might not name Henry Every, but they're dancing around it here. It's possible they did not realize what a big deal Henry Every was in that action yet. You know, thanks to all of the bad news coming out about New York, thanks to Richard Livingston, they knew all about Thomas II and John Ireland, Thomas Wake, Captain Mays, they... They knew that those guys were bad news, but Henry Every, they might not even have been absolutely sure that he was in the Indian Ocean. Then again, they might just be wanting to, for the time being, continue their policy of keeping Henry Every, who was growing into a bit of a folk hero by this point, out of the public record. 
Or maybe William Kidd was really in the dark about his real target. By the 1st of February, 1696, William Kidd was ready to set sail on board the adventure galley. As he prepared to get underway, the voyage was delayed once again. The issue this time was James II. There was a fleet being readied at Calais, and no shipping was allowed to leave the Downs. So, for a month, the adventure galley just sat there. But finally... Lord Bellamont sent final orders. The fleet at Calais was still a danger, but he had received an exemption for the adventure galley. Captain Kidd was free to sail. And Bellamont gave one final blessing. I pray God grant you good success. Next time we're going to catch up with the pirates down south, those mostly in and around the Indian Ocean, some on the coast of India, some escaping jail cells on the coast of India, others enjoying the sights and sounds of Java, and most of them gathering at Madagascar. I'd like to thank everybody for listening. I'd like to thank everybody who has helped to support the show, all of our patrons on Patreon, everybody who has left us ratings or reviews. I couldn't do this without all of you. On that note, I couldn't let you get away without once again mentioning Washington's War, 1779. If you've already picked up a copy, thank you very much. If you haven't, did I mention that a significant segment of the book is taken up with the establishment of the Culper Ring Spies under George Washington, one of the better stories in the American Revolutionary War? If you'd like to read about the origins and first missions of the Culper Ring Spies, Washington's War, 1779, by Benjamin Lee Huggins, now available on Audible, iTunes, and Amazon. Our theme music was, as always, The Old Captain by the fantastic band Brillig. If you haven't yet checked them out, you absolutely should do so. You can find them at brillig.com.au. That's B-R-I-L-L-I-G dot com dot A-U. After you're done over there, why not check out our website at piratehistorypodcast.com. As always, and most importantly, thank you for listening.